Maybe it's just got like a, pointing it into a, her mouth. A tricky like, semi on. Yeah, he did. He did actually look like he was not fully hard. Happy Monday, Team FD, and welcome back to Winners and Losers, where we take a look at the highs and the lows of the football from the weekend just past. Diving straight in with the man who puts the arse in Arsenal. It's Patrick van Straten with Robbie Keaton's suggestion. We're leading with the Gunners as our mm. foremost winners. Yes, indeed. They ran out 5-1 winners at home against Everton. And this was obviously the first time we saw Mkhitaryan and Aubameyang on the field together. They both started Synergy. this match. And history was on Arsenal's side going into it. They've beaten Everton 95 times in the league. That's the highest number of victories between any two Premier League mm. sides. So pretty impressive. Of course, beat them a 5-2 at Goodison earlier in the season. In fact, without Everton, Arsenal's goal difference would be plus nine. Not great. Unbelievable stuff. Stars of the show, and there were quite a few. Aaron Ramsey got a first career hat-trick. Ozil controlled the midfield. Ozil actually had the second most touches in the game behind only Granit Xhaka, and he made four key passes, though nobody could convert any of them. Aubameyang got a debut goal, which was deeply offside. <laughs> a little assist from the linesman there. Uh, and Henrik Mkhitaryan, for me, was the star. He got three assists in this match. He's the first Arsenal player to get three or more assists in a Premier League game since Santi Cazorla in 2013. I mean, that's pretty good company to be in. And to add to that, Mkhitaryan, four tackles and three interceptions. Pretty amazing stuff. Only Cuco Martina on Everton's side put in as many combined. So, Arsenal are kind of getting the benefit of the fact that Mkhitaryan has got something to prove right now. And it was a really enjoyable attacking performance, mm. if still a bit suspect defensively. OK, before I jump into the second segment, mm. I want to talk about Arsenal's January transfer window a little sure. bit. With the help of our friend Guillaume Balaguer. Over to you, Guillaume. I was looking back at what Arsenal have done in the transfer window and I thought, there are two ways to look at it. On one hand, you could just be absolutely ecstatic that uh, Arsenal managed to get Abema Young, who was the best goal scorer of the Bundesliga last season, Mikatarian, who cost £40 million pounds only 18 months ago, and, uh, and of course he was very good last season, especially in Europe. They got rid of Alexis and keeping Abema Young with less than half the wages that Alexis was asking for, but perhaps the same amount of goals, we will see. And of course, renewing uh, Ozil. So you'd say, Yes, that looks brilliant. I'll give you more elements for those that want to defend that point of view. Number one, uh, Osil is not earning £300,000 a week because the cap of Arsenal is £200,000 a week. That's the cap that they have and they, they will not change. Uh, that's number one. Number two, the owner is not putting money in Arsenal, so they have to kind of uh, work with their resources towards the, uh, the improvement of the squad. In, case, in the case of Arsenal, that's what they have, that's what they got to deal with whatever they do they have to uh, bring uh, they have to use by selling players for instance uh, so all, from that point of view that's where my vote will go I think Arsenal were very good in the transfer window uh, in fact they were short of money and they tried to get two uh, defenders uh, it looks like a team that right now is sixth and uh, and really uh, with perhaps the lowest point tally at this point of the season under Wenger ever I believe. Well, that suggests that uh, they needed the kind of reinforcement and it has changed the atmosphere a little bit, I feel, around the fans. So, from that point of view, that's another positive. But, if you look at what I've just said about those three guys, uh, does Arsenal, have Arsenal done well? What do you think? Thanks for that then, Guillaume. A couple of interesting points in there. Then, Arsene Wenger on his lowest points total at this point in the season thus far. I find that incredible, but probably alludes more to his consistency before this and the sheer competitiveness that is this season. Meza Erzo also only on 200 grand a week. Mm. Poor Meza, but apparently did get a sizable signing on fee. So slightly better, I suppose, from a business point of view that he's not on 300 because that is sort of Paul Pogba, Alexis Sanchez at Manchester United money, isn't and it? And better makes... for him as well, guaranteed money even if he ends mm. up leaving before the end of his contract. Yeah, it makes a little bit more sense. But I wanted to speak to you about Arsenal's and Guillaume, about Arsenal's sort of uh, last couple of windows as a whole, because to me, it sort of points towards a bit of a muddled transfer policy and maybe Wenger slash other people, you know, at Arsenal, you know, kind of clashing over targets and where the majority of the funds should be spent. 
Um, so January looked like this. Obviously, Giroud in, uh, Giroud out, sorry. Sanchez, Coquelin and Walker out to amounting to £50 million. Alexis Sanchez coming off the wage bill, bringing in Abemian, Mikatarian and Mavrapanos. In the summer as well, you obviously lost Gabriel, Ox, Chesney. Uh, I think Debuchy went in January as well yeah, as did. Perez. So, like I was saying, you seem to have lost a lot of first team players, a lot of depth there, and bought in sort of sheer firepower and a player who was misfiring at the start of this season. So, I guess what I'm trying to allude to is, as an Arsenal fan, do you see this as a productive period in Arsenal's transfer dealings? Or do you think that victories like last night are just papering over the cracks, sort of similar to what Guillaume was alluding to? Um, you use the word muddled, and I actually used that word when we did our transfer deadline day as okay. well. I thought this window was a little bit muddled, but I've actually come round to it. Um, we talked as well about taking the summer and the January transfer window as a whole. I don't think you can. I think they're two totally separate windows because the people running transfer policy now are so different. We've now got uh, Raul Sanjehi, who's obviously director of football relations, and we've got uh, Ms. Lintat, who looks like a director of football in everything but name. Um, and they've obviously only come in for the January window. So I think the January window was about righting the wrongs of the summer. The summer was a disaster. Arsenal should have sold Sanchez if he refused to sign a contract. Um, and reinvested in the squad immediately, but they didn't. January has meant that we're going to keep an elite attack for at least the next couple of years. Mm. No matter who the coach is, Arsenal's attack for the next couple of years will be good. Now that's kind of a relief because it means that Arsenal will stay competitive, and by competitive I mean somewhere between probably third and sixth, um, while they develop defensive talent and midfield talent. I think that the windows you want to take as a whole are this January window and whatever we do in the summer because these are Mislintat's first two. And what I expect to happen is that we bring in a bunch of youngish uh, midfielders and defenders in the summer. We move on a bunch more Deadwood because Mertesacker's contract comes to an end. Santi Cazorla looks like he's not going to play again. We've still got some guys who could be shifted out around the periphery of the squad. And that's how I'd really gauge it. Um, okay. At least the attack is good. That will keep us in the hunt. And then the idea will be that maybe over the next couple of years we develop and after that we bring through younger attackers. I quite like it um, because, frankly, Arsenal haven't had that good an attack up until now. Yeah, well, we did raise the question, where does Lacazette fit in with the Bemian? Sure. And seemingly, Arsene Wenger thinks his strongest team is with only one of them in the starting eleven. Now, do you accept that? Do you think there's a way back into the side for Lacazette uh, to play with Aubameyang if Aubameyang continues in this fine vein of form, sort of linking it with Mkhitaryan? Um, or do you think, OK, we've now spent £110 million on two strikers who are kind of supposed to be, supposed to have been bought in for the same reason, right, to get 15 to 20 goals. We've let Giroud go, who guarantees probably 10 goals from the bench, and mm -hmm. our goalkeeping situation and defensive situation has deteriorated. Would you... Just to sort of follow on from what you were saying, would you have rather spent that Abemiang money on defensive talent or do you think Abemiang was the signing they should have made in the summer and that Lacazette money should have been spent elsewhere? Or are you happy to have both at the club? I'm happy to have both at the club, I really am. I mean, Lacazette is still an asset. Um, he's a couple of years younger than Abemiang for a start. And if we ever did decide to sell him, I think that there'd still be plenty of clubs interested. I think he's been excellent this season. Um, I also wouldn't judge too much what we think our best side is based on this one game. I think when you're playing an Allardyce team at home, you expect them to shell. And so you play your guys who you think are going to pass well through mm. the back line. Especially when they're playing so, three at the back. Yes, yeah, so we, play, we played Iwobi, Mkhitaryan and Ozil. I mean, that, those are the guys you want to pass through a defensive line. I'm not sure that Iwobi's going to be a first choice. I think Lacazette's going to play. And it depends. If Wenger were to leave in the summer, there are rumours about people like Ralph Hasenhutl potentially coming in, who plays two up top. Allegri, who quite likes to play two up top from time to time. I think that there, this idea that a team has like a best 11, I think is quite an old-fashioned idea. And I think Lacazette will get plenty of game time. I'll be disappointed if he mm. doesn't. Um, Aubameyang, I don't think we could have got him in the summer for the price we got oh, yeah. him now. He would have cost a lot more in the summer. Talking of Aubameyang, he got off the mark with a delightful chip over Jordan Pickford, despite it being about two yards offside. He's the eighth player to score on his Premier League debut for the Gooners. Off to a flyer. But like we were talking about prior, Lacazette probably won't be overjoyed to see that star that he's made. Uh, he was on the bench for the entire game. In his last game, he failed to have a single shot. 
Obot managed three on Saturday, although who were you playing before? Swansea? We were terrible against Swansea. Collectively terrible, yeah. not just Lacazette in that. Um, but like we said, Sam Allardyce's three at the back, hugely sort of poorish to start with. And then when he went to four at the back, they were a lot more tight. It was much more of an even contest, wasn't it? Back to that Everton defence then, where, quite frankly, all of them were dreadful, particularly in that first half. I think Keen, Williams and Mangala made just three tackles and one interception on the night between them. And it was a nightmare debut for Mangala, who just looked out of sorts, not solely to blame. I think there was one point in the game I was watching when he tried to usher Ashley Williams out of defence, and Ashley Williams just looked at him like he was some sort of alien. Um, he then made an error for the goal and won just two aerial duels being dispossessed as much as attacking midfielder Meza Ozil in the game. Now just one win in eight for the Toffees after winning their first seven under Big Sam. But such is the sort of uh, fight uh, in that half of the table. They are still 10th somehow. But there is an opportunity for Big Sam to rectify this. They don't face another top six side until March. Guys, where do you think Everton are going to finish? Let us know in the comments. Our first losers of the week come from Abhishek Sharma. He's put Liverpool in there and frankly, they were very bad in the second half, were they not? <sighs> Just injecting myself with Barclays, mate. What oh, a so, game oh, this so was. Edgy. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> Liverpool failed to beat Tottenham in this game and that's why they're in our losers. Drawing 2-2 at home, conceding in the last minute of the game. Now Klopp wants to develop Liverpool into a possession side, doesn't he? But they only managed 34% of it in this game, taking nine shots compared to Spurs' 13, putting three on target compared to Spurs' six, which starts to create a picture in that Tottenham weren't that fortunate to get a point out of this game, doesn't it? Although Jurgen Klopp is now unbeaten in his last 13 Premier League home games against the Big Six, winning six and drawing seven, which is pretty darn good. I believe the last time a top six side took points from them at home was Manchester United in that 1-0 defeat in January 2016. Ooh. And they nearly got all three points, didn't they? Thanks to Mohamed Salah's little sort of genius with his... Throw. Uh, he got his second goal in the 91st minute. He's now netted 21 goals in 25 games. The quickest Liverpool player to reach that milestone. And my God, is in some decent company, isn't he? Fernando Torres, Michael Owen, Luis Suarez, Emil Heskey. Yep. Don. Uh, and the Egyptian, of course, uh, had a great game as he's making a nasty habit of doing 46 touches, 36 passes completed with a 70 cent. Uh, percent success rate, which is pretty darn good yeah, for a forward. Is. Four shots, four take-ons completed, two goals and one chance created. He's becoming the hub of that side. Not only is he their out-and-out -out goal scorer, he's also a provider, a creator too. And Carius, old slick back himself, Draco Malfoy deserves a big shout-out, making four saves on the day. Get this, he only made four saves in his previous six games. Hmm. Not so good. Uh, he also saved a penalty from Harry Kane in the 87th minute, which was a bit weird, and that Kane just sort of went down the middle and Carrius stayed down the middle. Like yeah. he was rehearsed. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. Harry, Harry Kane, he did get his second penalty in, which actually means he's now on 100 goals in the Prem. Uh, he's taken 141 games to do that, which is the second quickest of any player in Premier League history. No prize for guessing who the first is. It's obviously Alan Shearer. Oh, right. 100 goals in 124 games That's Alan Shearer got. That is nuts. That was before. That was when he had two knees, right? <laughs> it's so ridiculous. I mean, Kane actually kind of had a mixed game. He had five shots, three on target, scored the equaliser. But on the other hand, he played just six accurate passes in this match. And of course, he missed that pen as well, which is strange to me because when Harry Kane steps up, you do expect him to score now. Uh, Pochettino must be delighted though because his substitutes have finally made an impact. In the preceding 35 games, he had made 105 substitutions and those subs had only contributed to three goals. Whereas there are two in this game. Lamella, Lamella obviously won, won the penalty and Victor Wanyama. Oh so, scored God. an absolutely staggering goal. Now, did you see Suso's goal for AC Milan against it? No, I didn't, so I don't care. Absolute pair of pingzillas. Okay. Wanyama and Suso. It's a little poll. Whose goal was better? Settle the office debate. Van Straten doesn't care, but you might. Mm, interesting. Well, like, by comparison, Mourinho, in his last six matches, his subs have contributed to five goals. Wow. So that really shows, I think, actually, I think it shows more 
uh, about the quality of strength and depth uh, of, yeah. of Pochettino's squad. But it also might mean uh, the way he rejigs his side. So, for instance, when Wanyama comes on, you don't expect him necessarily to score, but you expect him maybe to give Deli Ali a freer role. So we don't really know what sort of effect these uh, these subs yeah. are having. Uh, now, one of the linesmen actually ended up being the focus in this game. Firstly, John Moss went over to consult him before the first penalty was given. And he said to John Moss, if the defender has touched this, if the defender's trying to play the ball and he's touched it, then Harry Kane is not offside and it's a penalty. If he hasn't touched it, he is offside and it obviously can't be a penalty. John Moss stood there like a kid in bottom set maths, trying to learn quadratic equations. Like he had no idea what was going on. Uh, but eventually the penalty was correctly given. Harry Kane missed it. Uh, Liverpool fans booing, 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 whining, 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 not surprising. Uh, and then he gave the other penalty later, called the game back after Virgil van Dijk had booted Lamella in the leg, which apparently is allowed because Lamella was looking for it. So apparently that's not a penalty, according to Liverpool fans either, though Lamella might have been offside. I did use know. the hate maths. I bet you did, even though you got glasses. You, mm. know, you look like you should like it, but just, you're just a nerd. Just, you know, <laughs> all about the written word, the spoken word, if anything. What word you, sniff. What, what are you talking about? Anyway, it was a total catastrophe because now people at home can hear the ref talking to the linesman and Christian Eriksen and Emery Chan getting involved, but we don't have VAR, which seems like the natural technological advancement which would prevent this kind of situation happening. Uh, Deli Ali got booked for a dive, also uh, a bit of a controversial decision in this game. Um, he's now been handed three yellows for simulation since his debut in the Premier League back in 2015-16. <laughs> no player has received more and he is generally a bit of a Unshaven. knob. Unshaven, oh right, yeah. Anyway, he's in our losers. Moving on. <laughs> <laughs> Talking of Bush. Hey, our next entry comes from at Joshua Locke. You're on Twitter and he's put Southampton in our winners. They've finally won a game. Oh my God. Who hasn't? Well, it's their first win since November the 26th and the team that hasn't is West Brom. Southampton blew them away 3-2 at the Hawthorns, uh, which keeps West Brom at the foot of the table. Now, despite going behind to a Higazi goal in the first half, Southampton fought back with goals from Lemina, Stevens, and Ward-Prowse. They end a 12-game winless run. Now, the Baggies were hoping that Daniel Sturridge would help them on his debut. He only played two-thirds of the match, got three shots, none of those on target, unfortunately, but he created a chance as well. And that's pretty promising, given that Pardew said, oh, he's not at the races, and he did look a bit sluggish. Um, that's still pretty good production. Anyway, um, pass completion, 72%. That says more about West Brom than Daniel Sturridge, I think. He's probably going to be a good signing, but to be honest, in this game, not a lot of service. Southampton had 61% of the ball. They had 13 shots to West Brom's nine. They had five on target to West Brom's three. Jack Stevens has scored in consecutive games for the first time. In fact, only Charlie Austin and James Ward-Prowse have got more Premier League goals than him this season. That is troubling mm. for Southampton. They're going to hope that Guido Carrillo comes in and absolutely bangs. Uh, Ward-Prowse now involved in four goals in the last two away games. That's as many as in his previous 28 appearances combined. Troubling long-term mm. trends for Southampton, yeah. but in the short term, they'll be delighted to get out yeah. of the relegation zone. Don't want to get ahead of themselves, do they? Uh, come West come Brom, now. though, <laughs> are an absolute crisis. That's one win in their previous 24 games, Before. drawing 11. Jesus, and losing 12. Hagazi, though, scored his first goal since his debut against Bournemouth. Uh, it's his first goal in 24 games. Sounds about right for a centre-back. West Brom have now dropped 18 points from winning positions, which is incredibly bad. And Alan Pardew now has just one win from his last 12 games, which is... That's Pepe Mel form, isn't it, mate? That's how exasperated you are. Imagine how the fans feel. And it's a shame it was such a poor performance because they were honouring such a wonderful player in Cyril Regis. Uh, former Aston Villa player, former Wolverhampton player, Coventry. Learned a lot about him growing Midlands. up in the Midlands. Yeah, exactly. Um, one of the most, one of the first prominent black players to play for England, despite the sort of disgusting abuse he received at the time. Uh, obviously meant a lot, didn't he, to a lot of uh, black players who have only just finished playing, like Dion Dublin, Jason Roberts, um, Brian Dean. Um, so he will be missed, but now West Brom have to rectify this 
downturn in form because it looks like they may be a championship club at this point. Uh, be, guess who they've got next? Chelsea. Ooh. A Chelsea scorned by Eddie Howe's Ooh. Bournemouth. Ooh. Hopefully Alvaro Morata will be back because not doing so well in fantasy without him. Alvaro back problem apparently. So get over it. Our second and final loser of the week comes from at Pacific XD West Ham. Boy, do they suck. Mm. What happened to them? Yeah, they got absolutely shafted at the Jorex 3-1 by Brighton, which was unexpected because the Seagulls hadn't won there uh, since December the 23rd. Ooh. Not great. West Ham stay 12th, but they're only three points above relegation. It is super Tight down there, Van Straten. West Ham only had 45% possession in this game. Four shots to Brighton's 21. Blackjack. Uh, and only one on target to Brighton's five. Now, Brighton average around 9.8 shots per game. So to have 21 is somewhat alarming yeah. for David Moyes, isn't it? Especially when he's playing three at the back with two defensive midfielders covering them. One in the form of Pablo Zabaleta, who hasn't played there since his mid to late 20s, has he? Have they got a combined age of about 70, um, their defensive midfielders? Yeah, although uh, injuries are a concern, aren't they, at West yeah. Ham? To be fair to David Moyes, all the momentum has stopped, probably as a result of that long injury list. Uh, now, West Ham have now lost four games against newly promoted sides this season for only the second time ever. That's two against Brighton and two against Newcastle. Noteworthy though, on a more positive note for Hammers, <laughs> Hernandez now has 43 Premier League goals after scoring that very well taken uh, finish. Actually did well to sort of elude his man, didn't he? All inside the box, only Tim Cahill has more with 56. All of his came inside the box, as right. in only Cahill has more when only considering goals inside the box. Okay, What a interesting. long winded way to explain that, but you take over. Okay. It was good, it was just hard to phrase, wasn't it? Oh. But you are the wordsmith, and you got there eventually. Mm, thanks. It's the first time Brighton have scored three goals in one game since the last time they played West Ham. So this was a nice relief for them after what has been a quite difficult season. Sticky situation. Gaitan Bong playing at left back, on fire, mate. On fire. 55 of his 78 touches were in West Ham's half. And actually, Brighton had only scored five in 13 before this match. But they could have won by more easily. They scored in this game. They scored against Southampton away the other day. So maybe their scoring form is starting to improve. Of course, Glenn Murray got one there. They've got uh, Lucardia coming in. So who knows? Maybe their maybe their attack mm. is starting to come together. How many uh, goals will Glenn Murray score before he goes to prison? Let is, us know in he, the comments is below. Is he going to prison? What's he going to prison for? Tax evasion, apparently. Ah, reportedly. Classic. Inverted comment. Notorious crime. <sighs> Man of the match, though, was Izquier, though. He scored an absolutely sensational goal. It could not be further in the corner. 91% pass completion for a forward. The most sprints of any Brighton player, which at least shows that he wanted to win, I guess. It doesn't show anything else, but it's the kind of thing that Jermaine Genas thinks is football analytics, the moron. <laughs> anyway, Pascal Gross scored. He also got an assist. He's now got five goals, six assists this season, which for a guy who costs 1.5 million quid is pretty damn good. But West Ham, what a week they've had. Masuaku suspended for six games for spitting. Head of recruitment, Tony Henry, is a massive fucking racist. Uh, and then battered by Brighton on Saturday. So it's been great for them all round. Next up, they've got Watford. Watford are coming for you. We will see how that goes in that relegation six-pointer. So that was this week's winners and losers. Did you appreciate the knob gags? Let us know in the comments below. Patrick Armstrong, what else is on Football Daily? Knob gag is in itself a knob gag, which is my favourite thing about that phrase. Uh, head over to 90 Plus One Facts for 90 Plus One Facts about Zinedine Zidane, our second favourite Algerian here at Football Daily. Magic Baguera being the first. No, the first is Zach's dad. Big up Larson. It, he's got a great head of hair. Have you he's seen actually it? called Larson. Yeah, it's magnificent, his head of hair. Anyway, no. what should they do other than that? Stay here or some um, shit? Maybe go and watch Babs Last Stand, oh, uh, the yeah, last episode that he will feature in in person. You know, we might get him on the plane. Kleenex at the ready. Delhi. <laughs> <laughs> Done. Southampton. The thing is, though, he does look like he has shaved his bush, <laughs> but in a very specific zone. He also